but we are we do feel very much at home. I'm going to read to you from 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14 through 19. Before I do, uh, as I was in prayer, the Lord was giving me a couple of words that are uh, part of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First, the gift of faith is going to be operating all day today. Yeah. Yeah. And if you weren't yeah. planning to come back tonight, I want you to come back tonight because we're going to have a little more time to actually lay hands and operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the gift of faith is going to be in operation all day. Yeah. And everybody has faith. Yeah. No, you couldn't, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have faith. You have faith. But there's a different kind of faith that comes when the gift of faith is in operation. Yeah. You know, the Bible says everyone has a measure of faith. Right. God's gave it. Yeah. Yeah. I know people who have a small measure of faith, and that's how they operate their whole life with us. Wow. That's their measure of faith. God gave them that measure of faith. Two ounces. We'll call it two ounces. And then we have people who operate their life with like 10 gallons of faith. That's their measure. These guys don't even look for a parking spot. They pray for a parking spot. A truck le leaves, a driver dies, something happens, and there's a parking spot. Because they operate their life with a bigger measure of faith. Now, the guy with the 10 gallons should not criticize the person that has a two ounce of faith. You're gonna die. And the person with the two ounce, that's his measure, shouldn't criticize the one with the 10 gallons, because that's his measure. But when the gift of faith rises inside of you, that's not your faith. That's not your normal measure of faith. It's like any other gift of the Holy Spirit. It's God's faith that comes and rises up inside of you. And when that happens, how do I know if that's gonna happen? I'll tell you because you'll start believing the unbelievable. Right. Something you thought was impossible is gonna begin looking possible yeah. to you. Yeah. You mean I don't have to live as a diabetic? Yes, that's exactly what it means. You mean this tumor is gonna disappear and I don't have to have surgery? Yes, that's yeah. what it means. You mean God can put a new liver or kidney inside of me? Yes, when the gift of faith is in operation, you're gonna believe the impossible yeah. and it's gonna happen. And when that happens, just reach out and grab what you just realized is possible. Just grab it. I'm going to read to you 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 14 through 19. And uh, Joash, the king of Israel, came weeping and blubbering because at that time the enemy, Syria, was greatly bothering Samaria. Right. Now, I don't know what version is up there, but I'll go ahead and read this one. He had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Now, some versions say he was very old and ready to pass away or die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof, or their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. And he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hands on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands and said, Open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot, and he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, who was the enemy. For you must strike the Syrians at Apec till you have destroyed them. I like the King James Version, it says completely destroyed them. Wow. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you'll strike Syria only three times. Wow. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, my brother. Appreciate your anointing. The enemy, Syria, was bothering Israel. They were aggressive. They would stomp up, stop up their wells of water so they'd have no fresh water to drink. They would hide so when soldiers came, they would sneak up on them and destroy them. They would burn their fields so they have nothing to eat and they'd have no harvest. And that's a type of what the enemy is doing to God's people today. Right. He'll attack you to destroy your faith, to discourage you, 
to make you want to pull away from God thinking there's no answer, there's no hope. And this is what was happening to God's people. The king couldn't stand it anymore. So the Bible says he came running to the prophet who was old already. In fact, this was his last prophecy. He was dying. He was in bed dying. And he comes and he cries, blubbering and weeps over his face. Probably his tears landed right on the prophet's face. And he said, oh, chariot of Israel and horsemen thereof. I was wondering why he said that. Why he didn't say, the enemy's bothering us. He's attacking us. He's stealing from us. Instead, he says, chariot of Israel and horsemen thereof. And the reason he said that, if you know scripture, is because a previous prophet, a previous miracle that the prophet worked was when Syria sent an army to grab a hold of this prophet who would pray and God would reveal the attacks of the enemy before they came. Right. I like that. Yeah. God will reveal to you the attacks of the enemy right. before they come. You don't have to be reactive in your Christian life. You can be proactive and say, what's he going to do next, right. Lord? Where's he hiding? What's right. he going to plan? What's he scheming? And so Syria got angry and so did the king. He said, okay, soldiers. He got his soldiers together. Which one of you is on the enemy side? Which one of you is spying? Which one of you is doing this? Because they know everything we're doing before we even do it. They know our plans. Right. There's a man over there, there's a man over there, King, and, and God reveals what you say in secret in your bedroom. Right, right. Well, let's go get him. They go to Dothan, and, and all around the, the Dothan, uh, they, the prophet's servant gets up in the morning as he goes outside, and he sees all these enemy soldiers. They're here to get us. He gets desperate. Oh, what am I going to do? Runs inside, and the prophet says, there's more on our side than against us. That's right. Have you been out there? Have you seen what I just saw? I don't think so. Yes, there's more on our side than against us. He walks outside and counts a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, six hundred, eight thousand, ten thousand. And he comes inside and says, one, two. <laughs> Man, you prophets are so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You haven't seen what I just saw. Your numbers don't add up. God, the prophet prayed. Open his eyes, spiritual vision, right. discernment. You should pray for discernment. Yeah. Discernment shows you not just the seen, but the unseen. Right. Sometimes you can see attacks of the enemy before they come or blessings of God that hide behind the scenes. Right. He said, open his eyes. When he did, he saw, whoa, he saw soldiers. Those are angels. Angels are not little babies with wings. They're soldiers and chariots of fire, the Bible says. So when the king came, being attacked by the enemy, he said to the dying prophet, chariots of Israel and horsemen thereof, where are the chariots of fire and the angels that came and protected us before? Where are they now when I need them? You know, that's a good question. Sometimes God will send vroom, angels to your protection and care. Send chariots of fire with great miracles. And then there's those times that he doesn't. And we get so angry. Where's the chariots? Where are the angels? Don't you know what I'm going through? Don't you know what attacks we're under? It's hurting. It's messing me up. I'm losing stuff. God, send angels. Oh, we want a God that will push a microwave button and send an angel. <laughs> and send a chariot. <laughs> and this time he says, no, you're going to win. But this miracle is going to be different. Okay. God is creative. Doesn't always do the same thing the same All way right. twice. And so he says, this time he says, you see this bow and arrow here? Yeah, pick them up. I'm going to pick up a bow and arrow. Yes, that means you're going to fight. You will fight. Somebody say, I will fight. 
Yes, that's the first step. First, he comes to the prophet. And, and you know, you got to come and seek what God has for you. If God's so great, why doesn't he help me? Doesn't he know what I'm going through? Uh -huh. Come to him. Right. Come to him. That's the first step. Right. He came to the prophet and crying and wondering, where's the protection of God? Where are the angels? If God is with us, how come we're going through all this drama? I know somebody here said that before. Yeah. <laughs> he says, pick up these bow and arrows. Pick up your weapons. What does that mean? That you will fight. You're going to fight. Somebody say, I'm going to fight. Some people don't want to fight. They want God to take care of it and me do nothing. And now, don't trust in your own strength. But when God says you've got a victory coming, he is guaranteeing you a battle. You're going to fight. God, you promised me the victory. Take this battle away. No, you're going to fight. You're going to battle. You will fight. Pick up these bow and arrows. Pick up your weapons. You're going to fight. You're not going to fight alone. And you're not going to lose. But you will have to fight. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says uh, that God has promised you the victory. He's promised you the victory. But how can you experience victory without a battle? Thanks be to God who has given us the victory in Christ Jesus. Pick up your weapons like the king was told to do so, but don't pick up carnal weapons. You pick up spiritual weapons. Listen to what I'm telling you. You cannot win spiritual battles by carnal weapons. So he said, pick up the bow and arrows. Don't get upset either if somebody doesn't fight for you. The prophet didn't say, you stay right there. I'm going to fight your demons. No, he said, you pick up the bow and arrow, you're going to fight your demons, but you're going to win. The prophet, the Bible says, put your hands on, he got the bow and arrow, and the prophet put his hands on the king's hands. Now, this is important. He laid his hands on the king's hands. In other words, you're not fighting alone. I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there. I'm going to back you up. I'm going to lay hands on you, but it's your battle. You know, Thank the Lord that you're in church. That's what church is about. Yeah. To support you, to lay hands on you. Not going to say, don't do it, I'll do it for you, but I'll be right there. Yeah. I'll disciple you, I'll show you what to do. I'll show you how to win this battle. I've been through a few before, so someone's going to lay hands on you. Someone's going to agree with you. If two agree touching anything they ask for, it'll be done. But he didn't take it away and say, I'm going to fight for you. No. I'm going to give you direction. I'm going to give you the word. I'm going to show you how to win this. And the king, even though he was a king, could have said, do you know who I am? Hello, I'm the king. No, he humbled himself and he said, please lead me. My pain is so, so bad. I'm hurting so much. I'm going through so much that I do need to submit. Lay hands on me. Pray for me. Give me direction. Show me how to hold my bow and arrow. Show me how to shoot. And then he told them, second, not only are you going to fight, open the window eastward. He said, open the window eastward and shoot an arrow. And we read that he shot right. that arrow. Open it towards the east. Why did he ask him to open the window and shoot an arrow towards the east? Listen to this. I've heard teaching on it, preaching on it. Some it's real poetic. And some, they say, well, because the sun rises from the east. <laughs> because it is a new day. And all that sounds good. But the reason he said, shoot your arrow towards the east, very practical reason, that's where Syria was. Right. That's where the enemy was. Right. Toward the east. Now, as simple as that sounds, shoot your arrow over the window towards the east and shoot your arrow towards the east. He was giving him an important strategy that we have to do also. And that is shoot and aim at your enemy. Right. Now, some people are fighters. They just don't know who the enemy is. Ah. They'll shoot their arrows against their children, against their wife, against their boss. Hey. I married a devil pastor. <laughs> I hit him on the head with arrows every day. And if you're shooting arrows at that which is not your enemy, 
shoot to the north, to the south, to the west. The enemy says, hit it hard. I'm, I'm okay, I'm cool, I'm over here in the east. You're not messing with me. Yeah, some people don't know which direction to shoot my their God. arrow. Hey, come on now. I mean, they'll, well, you know, it's my boss. <laughs> it's my cousin. It's that person. If that person is made of flesh and has blood, that's not your enemy. All right. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Hey. Yeah. You don't know what he said to me. You don't know what she did. True, true, true. But if they're made of flesh and have blood, we're not battling against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 13 says that we wrestle not, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness, against uh, demons in the air in celestial regions. Your enemy is not human. He, so stop wasting arrows and energy fighting humans. Wow. But, but, but do you know, he, he hit me. So I'm going to hit back. You fight fire with fire. The Bible doesn't say you fight fire with fire. That's what man says. That's what the world says. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to aim at everything except him. They I made me angry, I'm going to make them angry. They gossiped, I'm going to gossip back. They slandered me, I can play that game too. Oh, did you see what they put on Facebook? Just wait till I let them have it. Yeah. You're aiming north. You're aiming south. If you really want to put fire out, you don't put more fire on it. Everybody gets burned. How do you put fire out? Put the opposite on it, water. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, overcome evil with good. Bless those that curse you. Love those that hate you. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Aim east. Aim at your enemy. Hit him where it really hurts. Instead of saying, well, I'm not going to go to church anymore. That's right. The devil will say yes. And let everybody on Instagram know why, too. Just pour it out. Confession is good for the soul. Yeah, but it's bad for the reputation. Stop aiming every direction. Aim at your enemy. Hit him where it hurts. I'm going to go to prayer more. I'm going to seek God more. I'm going to get into his word more. I'm going to fellowship with the saints more. Aiming eastward. Attack your enemy. Hit him where it hurts. Fight spiritually. You can't fight and win if you use carnal weapons. Now, I love what the prophet said to him when he shot the arrow. He gave a prophecy. Yea, thus saith the Lord. You shall defeat your enemy Syria until you have, NIV and King James Version says, completely devoured them. 100% victory. There's going to be nothing left of Syria. I believe God's word. I believe that would have happened. Right. He said, nothing left of your enemy. Now listen, how many would love a prophecy like that? Yeah. Nothing left of your enemy. You're going to wipe him out completely. No more depression. No more anxiety. No more pain in your body. All of your family saved. Whoa. New strength like the eagle. Think about it. 100% victory. That's what the prophet told the king. You're going to have 100% victory. Wipe out your enemy. Wow. Anybody want a word like that? Yeah. Okay, here it comes. God wants you to have complete 100% yeah. over the top abundant victory. Yeah. Above and beyond anything we think or ask, the Bible says. That's his will. Really? Yeah. Now somebody will tell you now, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. God be glorified. Yeah, God knows how to be glorified even in our losses, but that doesn't mean right. he initiated that loss. God can make something beautiful out of ashes, but that doesn't mean that he burned the thing down that made the ashes that he now makes something beautiful out of. God wants you to be 100% victorious. God wants you to be a testimony to your doctor who says, what happened? Your blood is not diabetic anymore. 
What happened with that blind eye at Kensina? What happened to that liver? It's not the same one. It's a new one. 100%. God wanted that for the king. God wants that for you. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. God doesn't always get his way. People think, oh, yes, he does. He's God. He always gets. No, no, no. He doesn't always get his way. Mm -mm. And now we know one thing. God's will is that none should perish. God wants everybody to be saved. God wants everyone to come to him. But those who have read the scripture, you know that's not going to happen. Many people will reject his salvation, reject uh, forgiveness, reject his love of eternal and gift of eternal life. So he doesn't always get his way. And in this case, he didn't get his way. He said, you're going to destroy Syria. You're going to mess them up. Nothing left of them. And then he says, King, take the arrows that are here on the ground, pick them up and he said, smite the ground, hit the ground with it. We read that he took those after he cast towards the east and he hit the ground. One, two, three, and then it says he stopped. Ah. Now, the King James Version says he held back. Yeah. And when he stopped after three, the prophet now is mad. Yeah. Don't mess with us old guys, okay? Ah. Don't get us mad. <laughs> he got mad. He said, What? What's this one, two, three business? You would have gone four, five, six. Then you would have completely destroyed your enemy. But now three times you hit, three victories you'll have. Okay, what was wrong with the prophet? First he says you're going to wipe out your enemy completely. And now he says you're not going to wipe him out completely. Well, you know, he was old. He kind of lost it. Maybe the prophecy didn't come to pass because he didn't know what he was doing. Was it the prophecy or was it that somebody held back? God doesn't always get his way because we hold back. We come to God blubbering and crying like, oh, you don't know what I'm going through. But when there's something for me to do, when I have to take arrows in my hand and actually fight, and it costs some effort, and it costs some work, we say, oh, one, two, three. We live a one, two, three Christian life. <laughs> and you know what we get out of a one, two, three Christian life? <laughs> a one, two, three blessing. That's what he was telling him. You get in what you put, you get out what you put in. You hit three times, you're going to, well, I don't want to mess up my hair <laughs> or my nails. Isn't there an app for that? Do I really have to hit six times? There's got to be an app for it. Come on, let me Google. Let me see. Why do I have to hit five or six times? <laughs> yeah. Come on, Roy. And he held back. He went one, two, three. The, the passion was gone. The anger at the enemy was gone. That's the right. pain was gone. He got this word that said, you're going to win. Oh, I'm, I'm cool. I'm going to win. Everything's great. So now, giving it everything that anger of the enemy that had robbed him, that had messed up his family, that had destroyed his finances, it was gone. It had cooled down. And now he was, one, two, three. How's that? Did you watch the technique there? <laughs> Let me take a selfie of that. <laughs> Let everyone know that I'm destroying the enemy. Is, is he making fun of me? Ah, no. no. He says, if you just would have doubled your efforts. Four, five, six. Come on. Jesus taught about doubling efforts. That's a whole other message. If they ask you to go a mile, go two. Right. Come on now. Give it more than you're willing to. Come on, Roy. And when you do, he says, then you'll have complete victory. God wants you to have it. But we fall short of it because we hold back. Three times you hit, three victories you'll have. Those arrows that he put in his hands say something. Now, I'm not going to test you on this, but Psalm 7, 3, 13, and Psalm 18, 14, and Psalm 45, 5, and about 10 other places in Psalm, it talks about the arrows of the Lord's deliverance, the arrows in your hand 
represent God's authority, listen, against your enemy. The arrows mean God's authority against your enemy. And where are those arrows? They're in the king's hands. Where are those arrows today? They're in the hands of the people that are being robbed by the enemy. They're in the hands of men and women whom the enemy want to attack, rob, steal, destroy, and kill. God says, here, here I'm giving you my authority. In my name, they shall cast out devils. In my name, they'll lay, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God has given you his authority. You have God's arrows in your hand. What are you going to do with them? One, two, three. No. Four, five, six. Don't hold back. When you hold back, you're holding back your blessing. When you hold back from giving four, five, six, from praying four, five, six, from attending God's house four, five, six, when you hold back, you're holding back God's best. You're holding back God's blessings. He cannot completely destroy and defeat your enemy unless you completely and, 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 and with all of your heart hit and hit and hit. You destroyed my home. You messed up my family. I am addicted. I've lost my health. I've lost everything that I have. I'm not going to stop until I destroy my destroyer. Until I hit him with everything I've got. I want God's will for my life. 100% victory. And I'm not going to stop or hold back. Don't hold back. Don't hold back God's blessings. He held back. Don't hold back. As the church member, uh, re deep remote part of Mexico, a pastor friend said that they were building and, and very poor. There's not a lot of income in that area. And he said to one of his members who had very little, he said, now, mijo, he said, if you had a, two cars, would you be willing to give one to raise funds for the church? He said, oh, yes, if I had two cars, I'd, I'd give one. God knows my heart. If you had two properties, would you give one? He says, if I had two properties, yes, I would sacrifice and give one. He says, if you had two cows, would you give one? Hello, if you had two cows, would you give them? He says, well, let me think, because I really do have two cows. <laughs> We're willing to go four, five, six, as long as it doesn't cost that extra four, five, six, you know? Come to him. Come to him. That's what this king did. That was the first step. And then God gave him victory. But he had to grab a hold of that victory. He had to grab it and destroy the enemy. This is a day for you to do that. Don't settle for second best. Settle for what God wants for you. Complete victory. Your body can completely be healed. Your life can completely be made new. But it all starts like the king. He came. And I'm glad it was a king. Because you know how God sees you? As a king. As a queen. Prince. Princess. He says, come. Oh, this that I'm going through. I know right now you're, gonna, you're saying this is the worst that could happen. Someday you're going to say that's the best thing that could happen. Because it brought me to God. It brought me to the answer. It drew me near him. The Bible says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Uh, you don't know my life, man. I've kind of messed up. I love it. Yeah. I love to tell people. You've heard the old cliche, God hates sin but loves the sinner. It never really sunk into my heart until I met someone whose mother had cancer. And she said, I hate cancer. It's in my mother but I love my mother. She said, in fact, I love my mother so much, that's how much I hate the cancer. God really isn't angry at someone who failed. He's not angry at someone who drifted away. The Holy Spirit showed me there are people that will be here all day today who drifted. Come on. One of these attacks of the enemy did to you what it did to the king. It discouraged you. It made you weep. But instead of running to him, you ran away from him. 
And God hates that situation that made you run away. Hates it so much, he wants to wipe it out of your life. On, Forgive every sin, renew your life. But you have to be willing to take his authority and say, okay, I'm going to do this. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to destroy this. I'm going to surrender to him. Would you stand to your feet? I'm going to give the Holy Spirit some time this morning to operate in your life. There's someone who was in an accident who, whose back and your, your spine is out of whack. Some of your vertebrae are pinching nerves and there's pain. And you, you're told you, you just have to live with that pain. God's healing you this morning. You're in the right place. Not only are you, is the pain going to leave, you're going to be able to do some things you haven't been able to do for some time. I'm hearing in the spirit somebody say, I'm too young for this sickness, this disease. Today there's going to be several people healed of fibromyalgia. It's just going to leave. You're going to feel like a new person with a new body. I'm too young for this arthritis. Yeah, you are. You're never too old never too young God's healing your body this morning but before anything else I'm going to open up a moment so you can do what the king did came first yes. Yes. and every king had this ego problem it just by the fact that they were king they had to be forceful <laughs> and, and egomaniacs many of them and sometimes the enemy will put that on your heart and say you know what are people going to say if you like come to Jesus well I'll tell you what they'll say at Victory Outreach they're making the right choice because right. I did it too that's all you don't have to worry about who's going to think who's going to wonder who's going to criticize this is between you and God and you need to come and be willing to destroy the destroyer by letting God be God in your life receive his gift Forgiveness, salvation, healing, eternal life. I was looking at this year of overflow. You didn't tell me about that, but you know, this is what I've been preaching and teaching wow. since December of last year, that this coming year is a year of overflow. Come on. God's will for your life is overflow. Is he going to get what he wants in your life? Then give it your all close your eyes with me bow your heads i'm going to give an opportunity for men and women to just be healed spiritually and physically